online and communicating with them, uh, reading what they're reading, uh, watching what they're watching online uh, through various platforms, blogs, and so forth. And maybe even volunteering. If there's somebody uh, that you really admire that does an area that what you do, um, you know, for example, for cybersecurity, I don't do it, but let's say you really want to get into cybersecurity, and these days that's a very hot topic, uh, and maybe you want to really practice that in Europe, but you're not there. Maybe you find somebody who's doing that in England or in France, you connect with them on LinkedIn, and maybe you volunteer to write an article with them. Uh, and you do the research, and suddenly uh, you can co-author something with them, uh, or you present with them on Zoom or another platform, or you just you know volunteer or get involved in a voluntary bar association. Because these days, uh, exactly. voluntary bar associations are all remote now because we can't get together. And so a lot of voluntary bar associations are mm -hmm. figuring out ways to connect remotely. And if they connect remotely uh, between me and another attorney uh, in Miami, they'd certainly do it between me and an attorney in Africa or Europe or Asia. So these are unique times. They're unprecedented, but they're very unique and they provide yes. opportunities to reach out to folks that you probably never reach out to and for them to reach out to you and create yes. connections relationships that are probably unheard of just a few weeks ago. Exactly, exactly like what we are doing now. I wouldn't have come up with this idea or with this you know, series if I hadn't actually taken the leap to just go across, go beyond my comfort zone and actually reach out to you. And I'm so grateful that you are here today. Thank you very much. Okay, so it's, it's also really an amazing thing that you are a trial attorney. In our country, we basically use the word you are a litigation lawyer in quotes. Um, I think over your jurisdiction, it's called your trial lawyer. And you've been so for about 21 years. You've served on several organizations and all that. Now, um, how have you been able to leverage these volunteering activities, particularly using your, using your skills and your competencies to really gather such a wide audience and get across to a lot of professionals like yourself? How are you able to actually leverage these activities you did volunteering for a lot of these organizations you just mentioned? You know, I, I, a lot of it has to just do with relationships and confidence. Those are, I think, the two key terms. I think by uh, putting yourself out there, whether on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, whatever other platform you use or uh, are comfortable with, you get to know people, you get to interact with them, they get to know you, and if you like them and they like you, that's a basis of a referral. I think basically people refer cases to those they know, they trust, they like, and respect, and that takes time to develop that. But if you are constantly in front of somebody, uh, either on LinkedIn through your post or Facebook or some other forum, and, they're always, and you're always in their feed yeah. or you're always writing an article or providing a podcast that they're, they're reading or viewing, then you become part of their consciousness. And so when they have a need in your geographic region for a case that suits your qualifications, they're probably going to call you. It's just the way it is. Um, and I think there's also this sort of, yeah social or psychological idea of creating this, um, I don't know what the word indebtedness is the right word, but uh, the best analogy okay. I can come up with is when I was a kid back in the 1970s and I grew up in Chicago, I'd go to the airport to pick up or drop off family. And this was before you had to go through security okay. or uh, there was security then, but you could actually actually wait for somebody right as they were deplaning or getting onto the plane. And at the time, there were a lot of mm. Harry Christmas in the airport in Chicago. And what they would do is that they would give you their booklet okay. or a flower and then ask you for a donation. And they basically created this unwritten social contract. Oh. By them giving you something, they were basically expecting to give something in return. And they determined, and they actually studied this, they found out that if they just came up and asked you for money, the odds of you giving it to them was very small. But if they gave you something small first, mm. it was something really inconsequential, you would feel more obligated to return the favor. And so if you look at social media, especially LinkedIn as sort of a, a sort of that type of forum where you're giving out free content and you're sharing information, mm. and data and advice and books and webinars and videos, you are creating this unheard of social contract with some of your followers, not all of them, just many won't feel that obligated to do so, but some of them will feel a sense of obligation to you to give back to you some way. Uh, and that manifests itself in various ways and, and, and means. But so I think we all should obviously pay it forward and give something there. But by doing that, you're 
creating these relationships with people you probably never even met or known before and they just follow you and they get to know you and they get to understand you and appreciate you and someday they may have a case to refer to you and you didn't even know them personally but you created this contact and this bond uh, through this medium um, so that's you know that's my advice for anybody who uh, is trying to develop a book of business trying to develop relationships that lead to business you know find a forum you're comfortable in LinkedIn I think is probably the most natural because it's really dedicated and focused on business and there's a lot of lawyers on LinkedIn there's probably I don't know I wouldn't be surprised if there's a million or more lawyers worldwide on LinkedIn probably maybe even more than that exactly. um, and so and there's groups on LinkedIn there's different forums there's different ways of sharing content you can share video these days I, I i don't but i know some lawyers who do um and that's a great way of getting your word out and i think uh and that's the relationship i think the other word that i used was uh confidence uh by doing that you yes. create a certain level of confidence in yourself it kind of pushes away the imposter syndrome which we discussed earlier by exactly. pushing up content and yeah. doing it regularly especially if you find a niche for yourself and you're constantly posting about that niche people perceive you as an expert and perception sometimes is greater than reality. Mm. And I think, uh, I, mm. I have not planned to try to become an expert, but I think people kind of see me as an expert in different areas because I just post so much. Um, I don't, again, I don't see myself that way, but I think others perceive me that way. And it provides me a certain level of confidence when I interact with people, when I speak, when I communicate, uh, when there are any sort of discussions, I, I, I just kind of assume that I'm going to take control of the situation and people are kind of differential in that respect yes. because I've done it on this forum. And so if I'm doing it on LinkedIn, I can do it in other forms mm -hmm. as well. I can do it in a courtroom or in a, in, a, in, a, in a boardroom or when I'm thinking a deposition in a conference room. It's, uh, it's very similar. So, you know, find a niche, uh, push out that niche, get comfortable in that niche, and eventually people are going to see you as an expert in that area. That's amazing. Okay. Um, I think that that that's really true. Um, I've found it to be quite effective. Would I, would you say you've had any big breaks coming from your as a result of your visibility on LinkedIn? Have you had people independently reach out to you? And can you share maybe an experience that you basically want to tell us about? Maybe one of those big breaks that you've had actually using maybe LinkedIn. One of the things. Yeah, you know, I've had, uh, I get calls in a lot of cases. Most of them are outside my area and I end up referring them out. But I've had a few matters referred to me through LinkedIn uh, by other attorneys that turned into the cases we could accept and handle. Uh, we had a, an employment case we've handled. I think I've had a couple of employment cases uh, through LinkedIn. Um, I think what LinkedIn does is sort of one part of your toolbox where at yeah. the end of the day, you're trying to develop relationships with people and you want to stay at the forefront mm. of their mind. And LinkedIn is one of the ways of doing that. And so you may already have existing relationships with other attorneys, uh, but you want to be the first attorney they think of when they have a case. So it may not be necessarily directly through LinkedIn, but LinkedIn is sort of uh, a reminder to them to think of you. And so, uh, you know, you may get a case from somebody and they may not tell you they, got, they, they did it through LinkedIn because uh, you already have a relationship with them, but they thought of you instead of somebody else because they see you all the time on LinkedIn. And so, uh, so that's something else, you know, it's, it's sort of, again, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram, uh, it is a, yeah. if you kind of think of yourself as, you know, how am I going to get my message out to others to give me work? Mm -hmm. It isn't just one yeah. arrow in your, in your chest, you know, it's, it's like you have various arrows that you're kind of shooting from your bow and LinkedIn is one of them. It's part of a larger scheme and strategy and it kind of helps create your your persona and your brand okay that's great um and i there's something you even mentioned that i want to retreat so you've spoken about the use of, of legal tech in conducting trial and a lot of things now in light of this covid 19 situation one of the predictions uh from the mckinsey institute um did a recent research uh, also on cnbc and and it's been predicted that one of the changes that will occur is that um, you would have remote hearings, some of the things you've mentioned, e-discoveries, um, video conferences, social media marketing, uh, virtual CLE conferences, and most of these things will become the new normal. Now, you already agree that these are some of the things that are being done. Do you see these innovations happening? Okay, I believe it's already happening. 
But what would you what would be your advice for lawyers, law firms, and judicial systems that are actually struggling to implement these innovations? They maybe they are not yet up to date or struggling to actually accept the idea that remote hearings are actually possible. And some of the things you've mentioned. What would be your advice for systems, lawyers, and law firms that are struggling with that? Yeah, you know, I think technology is something that we all have to learn. Like, you know, I've I've only been using Zoom for a few weeks and I still make my shared mistakes on it and it's just a process. And I think with firms who are reticent about using it or about uh, or not really familiar with it, um, I think this is to become the new normal. At least for a while, and certainly in different parts of the world, uh, because I think social distancing is going to remain in effect. And people are talking about how COVID-19 may be a seasonal disease and may come back from time to time. And, and so this isn't going to be anything new. And so, um, and so in light of that, I think technology, whether we want to or not, and whether we approve it or not, is going to happen. And some firms, are, I, I think, are kind of waiting to see what happens, and they shouldn't. But even those firms are realize that they can't just stay on the sidelines for very long. And again, it provides certain opportunities. Like you mentioned, remote CLE. Uh, you know, before, if I had to speak somewhere, I have to get on a plane and go to the expense of traveling somewhere else and taking the time away from my day-to-day -day work to present and so forth. And now it's become pretty common to just do it in your living room or here, as, as I'm doing in my kitchen. And this is kind of the new norm. This is the expectation that people are okay with, you know, somebody kind of walking into the back of your screen. It's just part of the problem. You know, it is what it is. There's suddenly the volume going up or down. It's just, we're all getting used to this new technology. And it provides certain opportunities for smaller firms, uh, just using their iPhone or their Samsung and downloading a few apps and, you know, either in their bedroom or even outside, you know, speaking or sharing uh, their expertise on a certain area. Uh, maybe it's through, you know, Zoom videos or through YouTube or whatever else. I think, uh, technology is becoming much more part of our everyday fabric in the legal field and more people are embracing it, more people are sharing and becoming part of it. And folks who maybe three weeks ago who had never thought of going on a webinar to learn CLE suddenly realized that's it, that's the only game in town. That's be the only game in town yes. for the short term. And by the time things return back to normal, some folks are realize, well, wait, this isn't so bad. You know, I don't want to do this all the time, but I'd rather that's do this some of the time. That's great. And um, these are some of the things that I believe a lot of um, people need to begin to put into their minds. Um, we are practically in a system that you either innovate or die or perish. So everyone has to get with the program. So I've heard a lot of hardcore trial lawyers um, who are a bit averse to technology say things like, as long as you know the law, as long as you know how to apply the law, you are going to have a successful legal practice. I've heard that a lot. In fact, um, I've heard people say that as long as you know what to do, um, you, you can give good advice, you're fine. Do you agree with this statement? And do you actually believe that it's important for lawyers to learn skills outside their professional competencies, especially in the light of current events? Because you have lawyers who, this is my niche. Yeah, it's good to have a niche. But do you think it's important for a lawyer to maybe learn something about accounting, software engineering, maybe areas that are not so legal in the sense? So do you think that some of those things actually should be? No, I agree. I agree. agree that. Yeah, I agree with you. I think you need to be more well-rounded. Um, at the end of the day, we're a service industry. We are serving clients uh, in a way that our customers, much the way a restaurant would serve a customer or uh, Amazon or exactly. some other company would serve a customer and they have certain expectations and I think more people are tech savvy they want to deal with people uh, through technology and so we need to be familiar with the yeah. technology they want things quickly and turn around quickly so we have to be more responsive to them in terms of you know calling them back or texting or emailing them some people want to use you know instant messages instead of a, a traditional email um, I think a lot of that is being dictated by our clients these days. And I think clients are kind of pushing us, whether we want to or not, into new areas of technology and providing them better service. You know, I, I, for at least in the U.S., traditionally, uh, lawyers kind of set themselves apart. They thought that they were immune 
uh, to a lot of the changes going on mm. in the commercial sector. And I just don't see mm-hmm. that being the case anymore. Maybe there's certain clients that's true for, but more and more, most clients uh, are, are, want us to deal with them the way other uh, service providers deal with them. And they kind of see us yeah. as just another service provider and they have certain expectations. And if, you know, if their exactly. restaurant treats them a certain way or if their uh, cable company treats them a certain way, they want us to treat them the same way. And so that just comes in with, you know, being a better communicator, being uh, a better leader, understanding the technology and serving their needs and meeting them where they're at, as opposed to where we think they should be. All right, that's amazing. So um, at this moment, please, everyone, if you have a question, now is the time to, um, you can send it by chat. We have a couple of questions, which I would just go to. So we have a question from Emmanuel Okpara, and he says, COVID-19 comes with a wave of inevitable change. How promising is this change for a young lawyer? And how can we embrace it? I'm sure um, you may have given some answers, but if there's anything else you would want to add, um, we've talked about the use of technology, leveraging technology, but maybe you are narrowing it down to the young lawyer. So, Mr. Frank, how promising, it's very promising, I believe, um, is this change and how can we embrace the change? How should young lawyers take this approach? How should they be effective in taking this approach due to this yeah, change? Of course. You know, COVID-19 is, is a pandemic. It's terrible. Um, so many people have been affected worldwide. There have been so many deaths, certainly in the U.S., we're leading in the deaths worldwide. It is a terrible situation. But if there's any silver lining, it is really just changing the way we deal with each other in a way that people can interact with folks no matter where they are in the world. Uh, it used to be that you had to be in a certain region, state, or city uh, to interact or do business. That's just not going to be the case anymore. As social distancing is being implemented and folks are learning that they can and have the capacity to work from home, uh, people who they wouldn't otherwise consider as an employee or an independent contractor are suddenly on their radar. And so individuals, wherever you are, if there is a certain niche that you really want to practice and there is a firm or a company that does that, consider reaching out to them, you know, consider offering your services, maybe at first as an intern and then as a paid employee or a contractor. But these are interesting times uh, where I think boundaries and regions don't make as much sense or have as much of an impact as they once did. And so there are opportunities, again, through social media, through platforms like Zoom and others, where you can reach out and create relationships across the pond or across continents that no one really had thought about doing just a few weeks ago. All right, that's okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, Emmanuel, I hope that answered your question. So basically talking about putting yourself out there, reaching out to organizations first as an intern and saying, you know, with time, you're able to actually show yourself. Um, Mr. Frank, before I go to the next question, there's something you always say in your books and it's a phrase, pay it forward. What does that really mean? Um, I know to a certain extent how you've explained it, but conceptually, what does it actually mean when you use the term pay it forward? Yeah, it's a common phrase we use here, and it's a phrase I learned years ago when I first learned I didn't understand, but now I appreciate basically that, you know, each of us are blessed in a certain way. Each of us, certainly on this call, we're all lawyers, and uh, that wasn't easy for any of us. We had to go to school and pass certain licensing requirements, and now we're practicing, and, and, um, and we're certainly fortunate in that. And as we sort of progress in our journey in the legal field, the legal sector, and get more years under our belt, more matters behind us. I think each of us has an obligation to pay it forward and help those that come from behind to help them with opportunities to sort of mentor them, to show them uh, what we learn from our experiences, both good and bad, and share our wisdom. You know, each each of us has a destiny in this world, and each of us has a path, and each of us has to figure that out for ourselves. But each of us can help others figure it out for them as well. That's amazing. Thank you. And you talk a lot about mentorship. In a situation where you really have been, in many ways than one, uh, disappointed with a lot of people who, in quotes, see you as subjects rather than colleagues, how would you advise such a young lawyer to deal with such situations where they lack good and proper mentorship? What approach should young lawyers actually take when seeking to find motivation from someone who has already walked the path? Yeah, I think try to reach out to whatever 
local bar association or voluntary association of lawyers exists, whether it's local or larger, or if it has to, it can be virtual, but find somebody that has your same experiences and your background. Uh, that's probably, you know, a few years out more than you are, not necessarily somebody who's been out forever, but somebody who's been out maybe four or five years and still remembers what it's like to be in your shoes and try to reach out to them. Uh, yes. Again, these days are kind of difficult. We're not really meeting socially as much, uh, but a lot of organizations are having exactly. these Zoom calls or these Zoom happy hours. You know, try to connect yes. with somebody online and, you know, text them exactly. or Skype them um, and, you know, and try to just get their take on it. Sometimes I think each of us inherently knows whether we want to or not, where we're supposed to go and what we're supposed to do. And we just need to talk it through. Yes. And we just need an ear to listen to. Because a lot of the stuff I do when I talk to people, I don't really do a whole lot of talking. This is kind of unusual for me. I basically do a lot of listening yes. and then kind of share with them my thoughts of what they told me. And I think it, a lot of it's kind of self-apparent. Um, and we all have to kind of get there ourselves. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of trying to find a mentor, you know, if you can't find somebody uh, at your firm or at your company, uh, because they're not really inclined to do that. Try to find somebody in your local voluntary bar association. And if that doesn't help, then reach out to another bar association or find somebody online. Uh, but find somebody who uh, does what you do uh, and, and has somewhat similar mm -hmm. experiences as yours, uh, because you need that commonality, I think. I think trying to uh, find somebody that's sort of divorced from what your reality is, they can share their experiences, but yeah. there's going to be some disconnect there. And so commonality I think is important when finding a mentor. That's amazing. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to the next set of questions. And um, Emmanuel also asks um, a question. He says, a lot has been said about LinkedIn and how it helps in visibility. Is there a place of visibility for lawyers who are not writers? I ask this because most times when people talk about visibility on LinkedIn, it always goes with writing articles and likes. So he's basically asking for those who may not you know, be writers in their core, is there any opportunity for them to actually become visible on LinkedIn? And maybe uh, sure. that from this Yeah, you can do, um, there's a video now platform on, on LinkedIn. I haven't used it that much, but I see some people use it a lot and they prefer it. And you can record yourself on your cell phone, you know, 30 seconds, two minutes. Uh, we all have much shorter attention spans. So if you're going to do a video to LinkedIn, you want to keep it short and sweet. Uh, but that's certainly, you know, if you don't want to sit down and slack away on a keyboard, you can certainly record yourself. And the great thing about video before you upload it is that you can do several run-throughs until you find that you set it the right way and the lighting is proper and, and you're completely comfortable and then you can just share it. And then you can do that, you know, once a week or twice a week and have sort of a video library, if that's something you want to do. Uh, if you don't want to write personally, you can certainly share exactly. stuff you read. You know, you can certainly share it with like a one sentence uh, thought or idea of why it's important or relevant to the community you're trying to connect with. So there's different ways. Exactly. You know, I, I do do a lot of writing, but that's certainly not the only way of staying active. And certainly once you're on LinkedIn and you make relationships, you can reach out to people individually, uh, connect with them, message them, take the relationship offline, and just speak with them personally, either again through Skype or Zoom or WhatsApp or whatever else. Uh, there are lots of different ways of yes. communicating with folks. Okay, that's amazing. I'm um, going to the next question. And this is from Ulua Sheung Tijani. He's actually my colleague in my firm. Hi, Sheung. Um, he says, speaking of finding a niche, what would you recommend for a young lawyer who is finding it difficult to settle for a particular area of law? So there's so much, particularly as um, in court litigation lawyers or trial lawyers, advocates, as it were. There are so many practice areas. How do you navigate those areas to find a niche that actually works for you? And really, is it important to actually start with a niche early in the early stages of your career? Yeah, I, I, that's always tough because um, there are so many different practice areas. And sometimes people just sort of fall into an area because they work for a firm and the firm does X and so they end up doing X and Sometimes it works out for them and sometimes it doesn't. I think you kind of have to ask yourself, you know, what are your interests and hobbies outside the law and what do you really enjoy and see where there's intersection between mm -hmm. those hobbies and the practice areas that you're interested in. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're going to be doing this for several decades. And so you want to find an area mm -hmm. that you enjoy that challenges you intellectually, that you 
uh, enjoy dealing with the people and it might be trials and maybe litigation and maybe drafting documents, maybe wills and estates or bankruptcy or family law. And so I, I think most people just say, well, you know, kind of look at the different areas and, and see what you like the most. But that's not probably the best approach. I think kind of be honest with yourself and mm. do an assessment of what your interests are. One of the books I wrote is Go Motivate Yourself, which is a free book you can download. And there's a section yeah. on trying to discover what your talents are and what your interests are. And it's just a series of questions you can ask yourself. A lot of them aren't even law related. Uh, but if you do a self-assessment like that and trying to figure out what you really enjoy outside the law, you'll probably figure out what you really enjoy inside the law. That's amazing. Thank you. And there's something you always said in your books. Um, for everyone who's joined this session, um, I will provide the links to Mr. Frank Ramos's books available. I will send them by email. Okay, sir, so, um, there's something you talk about, strengths and weaknesses. And you are a fan of develop your strengths and just work on your weaknesses. What, well, how, can you explain what that means? Because my understanding is that if you're good at something, go forth in that direction. If you find something that is a bit a struggle, don't focus so much on it. I don't know if I'm getting, if that's the point you're trying to make. So I just want you to clarify that about when talking about leveraging your strengths. Yeah, you know, I think each of us has certain level of talents. I think each of us is born with one or more talents. And I think it's up to us to discover. <laughs> okay. And so we have to figure out what those talents are. And, you know, in order to be a successful lawyer, we have to be good at writing, good at speaking, good at communication, good at a number of tasks. But, you know, each of us aren't going to be good at everything. And so we have to figure out first what our talents are. And sometimes, going back to the last question, figuring out what we want to do and what areas we want to practice in, I think a lot of that's talent-driven uh, because I don't think there's mm -hmm. a coincidence that each of us is good at something or good at several things. And typically, what we're good at is what we're supposed to be doing with our lives. And so if you can kind of discover what you're good at, develop it, and become an expert at it, I think you're, that's our, you're going to gravitate toward the uh, practice areas you should be doing. If you're very good at communication and you really like talking to people, you're mm. probably going to become a trial lawyer. If you love to read and you like the intellectual challenge, maybe you'll become an appellate lawyer. If you like to look at, you're very detail-oriented, uh, you may be drafting contracts. And so you kind of have to find out for yourself mm. where your skills lie, and that might be sort of, the lodestar for you to figure out where your career should be uh, going. Okay, so you you summarize this in three steps. Find what you're good at, become an expert at it, and keep going. That's, that's incredible. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So I'm going to the next question. And um, so, okay, sorry, this question is from Adara. Um, hi, Adara. Now, speaking on diversification, how should young lawyers in an environment that most times require a certain expertise? So I think this person is trying to ask how young lawyers in an environment that requires a lot of expertise and you're just starting out, how can you begin to you know, tread that path, especially when you know, you're trying to carve a niche for yourself and you're in an area that requires a lot of experience or a lot of exposure, but you feel like you know, what, you're, what you have is not enough. Yeah, you know, I think typically you start by trying to read everything you can in the area, uh, both substantively in terms of whatever statutes or cases or regulations are out there, but you also go online. Mm. Uh, and these days, there's just such a plethora of information in every area, in every practice, in every region, that's mm. for the most part pretty free. I mean, obviously, uh, sites like Westlaw and Lexus have a cost, but there's a lot of free information that's shared uh, regularly. And so my first piece of advice is to read as much as you can in that area and learn as much as you can and then get involved in a voluntary bar association, which, a, which has a substantive committee in that area and get involved with them and, you know, attend CLE online, get to know people who've been that practice, uh, you know, meet with them if you can in person. Obviously these days that's difficult, but, you know, talk to them and try to learn and, and act like a sponge and try to gather as much information as you can. There's okay. certain areas that, you know, you, you can probably learn in a few months, certain areas that may take a few years longer. That depends. Um, I guess one of the benefits of learning an area that is very complicated is that most people aren't going to make the effort. And so if you stick with it, eventually mm -hmm. you'll be one of the few people in that area that's sort of known as a go-to person in that sector and people will come to know you. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a longer path, it's a longer voyage to get there, but it's certainly a worthwhile one. 
Yes, thank you. We have some of that. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Okay, so to the next question, please, you can keep writing your questions if you have them, but we will just take a few questions from now. So um, this question is from Kingsley Uguchuku. Hi, Kingsley. It's a pleasure having you here. He says, Mr. Frank, do you think the legal profession will ever revert back to analog law, given that lawyers are now forced to use tech and move with it in all aspects of their daily work now? at least until the social distancing rules become relaxed? I think that question was answered. I don't know if you have any additional thoughts. Thank no, I, I agree. I, I think we're never gonna go completely back. I think, again, there'll be a subset of lawyers, especially ones that are more senior, that just hate technology um, and don't wanna go back. They don't wanna be paperless. They don't want e-discovery. They don't wanna deal with computers. They still dictate things and um, they're kind of going the way of the dodo bird. But, um, I think for typically, uh, this is the new reality. And uh, whether you, you go kicking or screaming or not, I think this is going to substitute in large part the way we used to do things. Um, we'll go back because I think we all need in-person interaction and uh, socialization. But I think this has really kind of pushed and advanced the ball forward a great deal in terms of legal tech. All right. Thank you very much for that. Um, so I get that, that, that goes us. Um, this is a very good question, I think. Um, Martha Babatunde says that, I would like to know how a young lawyer who has found an area of specialization in law choose a mentor. So when you find an area, how do you actually choose? How can you choose a mentor in that area? I think a good way is if you've picked an area, let's say data security, because that's a very finite area. That's a very hot area. Okay. Uh, try to find a lawyer that practices in that area and work on a project with them. Maybe work on a mm -hmm. webinar, work on a paper, work on something. And basically you're giving them value by providing them research or assistance. And they in turn are give you value by mentoring you. I think all mentoring relationships uh, go both ways. You know, I think it is something that the mentee benefits from, but it's also something the mentor can benefit from. And for the mentee, they're getting experience they wouldn't otherwise get. And for the mentor, Maybe they're getting access uh, to information. Maybe they're uh, getting some sort of service they wouldn't otherwise get. So if you're a mentee and you're looking for a mentor, mentors are being hesitant about trying to take time to share their experience and their wisdom with you, offer to do something for them. Again, co-write a piece, uh, co-present a piece, you know, help them with their website. You know, maybe they're one of the people who really knows in every law, but they're really struggling with technology. They don't understand Zoom. They don't understand LinkedIn you know, volunteer to help them with that and they'll teach you. So it has to be a symbiotic relationship and the more you're giving, the more you'll get in return. Of course, of course. Thank you so much. Um, and that actually is true. Um, sometimes everyone just wants to get something, but actually think of what you can do so that people perceive that you actually have something to offer and value as well. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, sure. So what approach... Um, should young lawyers who are interested in cross-border practice um, while still trying to maintain their domicile location take in light of this global event that has hit us all. So um, you're trying to seek an area of specialization in a place that is not Nigeria, you know. So if they're trying to still maintain their location in Nigeria, how can they, you know, what kind of opportunities should, now, should they be looking for? You know, there are a lot of international, yeah, there are a lot of international firms that are either based in the U.S. or in Europe that have offices throughout the world. And they use, uh, and they hire both associates and contract lawyers around the world to deal with all sorts of issues, both issues where the, those individuals are domiciled and as well as issues elsewhere. And so, you know, go online and research the large firms, the big international firms, the ones that have several hundred or even several thousand lawyers and staff and, you know, and reach out to them, see what opportunities they have. They may not have any, they may not even respond to you. A lot of folks aren't the most responsive, but certainly inquire. There might be opportunities out there that you're not appreciating uh, that are available. And again, these days, uh, there are certain firms that really look to hire people abroad for a variety of reasons. And I think that's gonna be accelerated in the current situation. And so there'll be more firms that maybe before didn't think about it that way, but are certainly uh, reevaluating and sort of looking at it, those terms. So, you know, research firms that have a worldwide grasp and reach, reach out to folks in those firms. They may have uh, uh, somebody at an administrative level that hires people or at least 
provides information about hiring and are willing to bring you on uh, to help you do research or writing uh, or some other thing. You know, I, it's, it's, there's so many different opportunities. It's, you have to kind of explore and see which ones are available. Okay, that's amazing. Okay, we're almost coming to an end of the question sessions. Thank you so much for staying with us. No, um, so this is the, this is the second to the last question. And uh, this is from Ayorin Day Boyo. Hi, Ayorin Day. Um, he says, Mr. Frank, do you actually think it is proper for a young lawyer to carve a niche at the early stage of practice? So for people who feel, you no, know, let's do a lot. Let's, let's see how it goes. Do you think it's actually proper to actually start with one focused area at the earliest stage of practice as a young lawyer? It, it has its risks, obviously, especially if the area of law mm -hmm. you're choosing is very narrow, it's very niche practice, mm -hmm. uh, because if it doesn't work out, then that's all you know. Uh, but the payoff can be very substantial. Uh, I have a friend uh, who I went to law school with who became an alcoholic beverage lawyer right out of law school. I didn't know that was even an area and that's all he does. And that's all he's ever done. And it's very lucrative for him. Um, and that's, you know, he doesn't know anything about litigation. He doesn't know what I do. Uh, what he does is very narrow and he basically gets licensing contracts and deals. Uh, but that's what he chose. Uh, you know, if he had chosen a different area, maybe he wouldn't have been as successful. Uh, but at least in, in the U S the idea is to try to find an area that you're specialized in. So I think more and more clients are looking for the best in that area. And so if you can find a, a niche that you're comfortable in, that you enjoy, that caters to your talents, uh, yes, there are some downsides. And you may find that there are fewer opportunities for firms. But if you find uh, a firm that does do that practice or you find clients are interested in doing that, you may, sort of, you may have a, a corner of the market in that area. So always think through, you know, is this something you want to do the next 10, 20, 30 years? If it is, you enjoy it, take, give it a shot, and you can always try to do something else later. Okay. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Um, so I think this is the last question that we will take. Um, and he says, thanks a lot, Mr. Ramos. Really great to hear you speak after pulling for so long online. Thank you. Um, my question is it okay to restrict, okay, I think this is quite similar, but I will just read it out just to add um, a few points. So he says, is it okay not to restrict one's law practice to a specific area? I am personally interested in and carry out my practice in a couple of areas. And sincerely, I feel that if I limit myself to just an area of law practice under the idea of specialization, I'll be unfulfilled at the end of the day. So I think your last answer answered this, but I don't know if you wanted to add something to just address that particular yeah, issue. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think you, you shouldn't specialize for the sake of specializing. Uh, you have to find an area that you enjoy. Uh, it's, there, there, there are lots of hot areas at any given moment, and you shouldn't just join it because it's a hot area, because things change over time. You have to find an area that challenges you, that you find intellectually stimulating, that, that you enjoy. And again, some areas are very narrow, some are a little bit more broad, but you're, you're more likely to get calls from people if they consider you an expert, and you're more likely to be considered an expert if you focus mm. on one area. It's hard to just be a litigator or a trial lawyer. It's much easier to be an IP lawyer or a patent. So that's just how it is. Okay, thank you very much. And I think that's the last of the questions. And so uh, thank you everyone for actually being part of this. Uh, we will wrap up in about 10 minutes. But before we do that, um, I would want Mr. Frank to give us any words, um, anything that crosses your mind. Do you have any thoughts for us going forward? Any form of advice um, so that we could wrap this up? Uh, sure, sure. Um, you know, again, um, you know, legal career is very challenging. It's very demanding. Uh, we, you know, there's lots of things for, um, for us to do and a lot of things to think about. It's important for you to sort of think through why you became a lawyer, why you went to law school, why you got licensed, you know, what motivated you when you were younger, when you were going through high school or college or law school or whatever institutions you've been through and always kind of go back to that because that's where, that's why you're here now. And 
you know, we're all have obligations. We have families, we have bills, we have responsibilities. And a lot of times we, we forget that we forget what motivated us to come here in the first place. And so my best advice to you is to never forget why you're doing what you're doing. Not just the day-to-day stuff, not just the, to put food on the table, but sort of the bigger picture of what really motivates you. Does that sort of get you through the tough times, the challenging times, the dark times? And that's going to help you continue with the profession. A lot of people walk away from it. A lot of people, especially in the U.S., they become lawyers within 5, 10, 15 years. They're doing something else. Don't, you know, and I know it sounds kind of surprising, but I know a lot of former lawyers. And so if you're going to sustain yourself doing this for decades, you need to always go back the first principles and appreciate why you're doing it. Okay. That's an incredible advice. And thank you very much for that. I don't know. Somebody is sharing her screen. Please. Can you not do that? Sorry. Um, it's actually interrupting. Please. Can you stop? Um, Abiola Ogedemde. Sorry. I'm trying to sort that out. That's okay. All right. Yes. Please, could you cancel your screen sharing? Thank you very much. We are waiting for you to do that so that we can move forward. Can anyone chat, please, if you can see um, her screen? I'm trying to see how to sort this out, please. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I think that's been sorted out. Okay, she's still doing this again. Um, sorry, let me just, okay. All right, okay, so I think that's that. Um, so thank you very much for sharing these thoughts with us. Um, it's been quite insightful. Now for your books, how do we get access to your books? Oh, sure, if you follow me on LinkedIn, you don't even, you don't even have to follow me on LinkedIn. If you just pull up my profile and you scroll okay. down under my profile, there's a section called publications. It's kind of toward the bottom, so you have to keep scrolling down. And you click on it, uh, there'll be links to, I think, about a dozen books, both of which I wrote, a couple I co-wrote. And they deal with a whole host of issues, and they're short, they're fast reads, and some of them are applicable to our U.S. system, but most of them are very general, and you may find them helpful. Okay. So do you have a website that we could actually contact you on? I think it's on LinkedIn. So please, if you want to get more insight, I can assure you, Three hours, four hours, six hours is not enough to ingest the wisdom that Mr. Frank has for us. So please um, do follow him on LinkedIn. And when you do that, you could also share insights that you've gotten from this very short um, session using the hashtag, the Young Lawyer Mentorship Series or the Future of Law. Please, you can tag Mr. Frank Ramos and I believe that he will drop a comment or two or a like or a thumbs up. <laughs> I believe he will do that. We'll be expecting. Absolutely. So we just want to say, Thank you very much. We are so grateful to you. Thank you for answering our call. You've been really inspired us. Um, while preparing for this, I was so excited. I got calls from so many people and, you know, everyone was just excited. And I think we all are. So in the light of no further questions, I think this is where we would actually wrap it up. And I just want to say thank you. For those of you who joined in late, um, we would actually, we are actually recording this right now and it will be available. Um, I believe it will be available on LinkedIn on our YouTube channels. And so you can always go back and re watch everything. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, let's, can everyone say thank you? I'd like to see your chat, you know, um, just to say thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you I've been reading it. Yes. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much. And until we come your way next time. But uh, this is where we would actually say goodbye for now. Thank you, Mr. Frank, and thank you for your time. We are so grateful. There's so many comments here. And, you know, I'm tempted to actually do a screen selfie. Everyone just put their faces together. So I'm going to do this. Please let's be orderly, all right? Don't mute. Don't unmute your volume. But you can unmute your video. And then, of course, you can have a screenshot um, with the speaker. So um, let me do that feature now. All right, uh, everyone says, thanks a lot, Mr. Ramos. You are awesome. Yes, he's awesome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time and the opportunity. Yes, um, just, yes. Thank you very much. Okay, let me see. Okay, so um, there are so many people here. So I can see people with their videos. I don't know, Mr. Frank. I don't know if you can see a lot of us. I, I do. Thank you. I really appreciate all the positive comments. It's very 
Very delightful. I really appreciate it. Okay, so everyone, you can just do a screenshot. I believe that um, you would, when you open the meet, when you swipe to the left, you'll be able to see Mr. Frank and you can actually see your picture. So just, it's like a selfie thing, right? So we are doing e-selfie now. And that's actually great. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you very much. Oh, we have a lot of comments. Um, let me see if I can read them just to say thank you. Mary says, thank you, Mr. Ramos. It was worth it. Emmanuel says it has been expository and inspiring. Um, my the chairman of the um, Ikeja branch, um, ILF, that's Young Lawyers Forum. He says thank you. Um, he has been very instrumental to my growth. Thank you, Ezekiel. Uh, Nathaniel says thank you, Mr. Ramos. You are awesome. Lily says Swam. Hi, Swam. She says thank you very much. It was really exciting. And we have so many comments that time will not allow me to read. I believe right now, what time is it over in the U.S.? I think um should be. It's 12.15 uh, right now. Yeah, 12.15. Yeah, 12.15. 12 All right. And I know that you are going to, you have a long day ahead of you. So um, at this point, we'll say thank you and have a very good time. Goodbye. Have a great one. And thank you so Bye, much everyone. for coming I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.